Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kaya Carrington-Russell, award-winning author of Kick Butt Heroines and Steamy Action Packed Fantasy Worlds. And I have a very special guest for you today. We are talking science fiction and steamy alien romance. Known for books such as Choosing Theo and Freeing Luca, we are talking to the one and only Victoria Avalon. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm excited, like super excited, especially now that I found out you're having a gin and tonic. I'm a little bit jealous with my coffee now. Yeah, well, it's the time here, (laughs) the end of the workday. Yeah, well, and you were just telling me you're on a deadline at the moment, so you've been writing crazy words. Yes, yeah, it's been pretty stressful. Um, I, uh, It's always like this, though, no matter how far out I push the deadline, I'm always working right up to the wire and just working long nights and never seems to change no matter how much I try and manage my time. <laughs> you've, you've given yourself an interesting career path. Take me back to the start then. Why, why did you choose this career and where did you begin? So I had a little bit of um, an odd start, I guess. I um, never wrote anything. And uh, actually through school, I was kind of told that I wasn't a very good writer. I was, um, it wasn't my strength area at all to the point that uh, in college, my college advisor actually wanted me to get a writing tutor. And um, so I just never thought of it as any kind of hobby that I should even try and undertake. Um, But since for as long as I can remember, I've always, always, always had stories in my head. So I've always been kind of Um, daydreaming whenever I fall asleep I am thinking of a story whenever I was on a long car ride I was listening to music and picturing a story in my head um, most of the time with romantic leanings and um, so that's been going on for my whole life and uh, but I never wrote any of them down Um, and I've always loved stories of all kinds movies and tv shows I've been a big reader So I've always been really interested in storytelling. Um, And then in about 2017, I was reading a lot of romance and I was diving into a lot of, you know, Kindle Unlimited romance and romance that maybe wasn't edited as well. And I started thinking, I still really love these books. Like the writing isn't perfect. The, you know, the sentence structures are kind of clumsy sometimes, but I really, really enjoy it. And I started to wonder if maybe um, storytelling and mechanical writing weren't necessarily the same thing and that maybe you could be a good storyteller and not necessarily a really good writer. So I um, had a story in my head that had just been clawing and clawing and clawing at me. And so I started to write it down and um, I just kind of would sneak away and like take time. I had a morning job and, and an afternoon job. And then in between that time, I would just write and write and write. And then um, I had some like family, personal stuff in my life come up and I had to step away from a lot of things and I put it down and I didn't look at it for a really long time. And um, when I finally was like, oh, I wonder what that story was about. I went back and I looked for it and I couldn't find it and it was lost on my computer (laughs) And because, you know, I had, I had had self-esteem issues about my writing and I was trying to do this pretty, pretty secretively. I wasn't telling anybody that I was doing it. So I hit it really, really well in my computer. So nobody would stumble across it. I didn't stumble across it either. (laughs) And um, so I, just said, oh, well, I guess that's it. No more of that. And then um, I was going through my computer for some reason in 2019. And I came across a file that was really weird. And I was like, this is out of place. What is this? And I found it. And I read it. And I was like, huh, this is pretty good, actually. I think this is a story that people might want to read. I think this looks good. I think I should try finishing this. So I did. And I, it was still all secret. <laughs> and I, um, I like hired an editor. I did all of my research on self-publishing. I got a cover. I did all of those things. And I didn't even tell my husband that I had done it until ARCs were coming in and reviews from ARCs were coming in. And then I finally, I just still didn't even tell him what it was. I just told him that I had written a book and I'm going to be publishing it and we'll see what happens. 
And um, that was my first book and that was Choosing Theo. So it's literally the first and only thing that I had ever written at that point. I think I am a good storyteller and maybe not the most beautiful, eloquent writer mechanically, but I think that those are things that you can learn and that's why you have an editor. So that's how I got started. (laughs) What I love about this, this is kind of a bit of an underdog story, I want to say, because the fact that you had people telling you this isn't your lane, this isn't, you know, and honestly, I've had a similar um, response from my English teacher as well. And I find it so interesting, too, because you published that book in 2020. Well, you now have over 5,300 reviews on Amazon for that book alone. That's yeah. amazing. I think that there is a real difference between storytelling and being a good storyteller and learning the craft of writing. And I think, don't get discouraged if you feel like you have a story to tell, but you don't think that you can do it in a way that, you know, people like teachers and stuff will respect because they're looking for things to pick at. And, you know, I still, I can't do comments to save my life. I'm a whore, I'm not a clean writer at all. But again, that's what my editor is for. And she helps me, you know, work out my clumsy language so that the story that I have, which is good, can come through. Can you tell us a little bit about Choosing Theo and for those who haven't yet read it and should, what it's about? Well, it's a sci-fi romance. And so it's pretty typical in the in the setup of that, in that it's a Mars needs women trope, lots of men on a planet, not a lot of women of their species. And then humans are abducted and kind of plopped there. And they're pushed into this culture and they're not allowed to go home. And it's about them all finding love on this planet where the, you know, the, the customs are very different and the standards are very different. So that's, that's what that's about. (laughs) I'm super excited to read it because I've been seeing a lot of your TikToks. I've stalked you a little bit um, and I'm super ecstatic and we'll get into that soon. Um, But yeah, it looks super amazing. What would you say then your advice and tips would be for say, newer authors who are wanting to get into that sort of steamy alien sci-fi romance? I think, well, there's two ways to answer this, right? There's, you know, what is my advice from the back end in terms of marketing and how many books you should write before you release and all of that. But uh, I really want to answer the creative aspect because that's what I love. Mm. Um, I think if you're looking to write a sci-fi alien romance, you really want to make sure that you don't skimp out on the world building focus on the world building as if it's its own character, spend a lot of time, because I think that's what um, sci-fi romance readers really want to see. They want to see the cultural differences, and they want to see how the aliens are different, and they want to see how that affects the steamy scenes and the romance. And I think sometimes people maybe have a tendency to write a world and plop their characters into it, rather than having the characters immerse themselves in the world and interact with it and um, push the plot forward using the world building. And I think um, that's one of the things that I think is the most important about our series or our our genre. Um, When I, when I first discovered sci-fi romance, I, um, I was blown away because I I read a ton of romance. I read paranormal and fantasy. And I, I think what made me so interested in sci-fi romance was that the boundaries weren't there. You know, when you're reading fantasy romance, there's kind of standards, you know, it's it's orcs and it's a bit medievalish in time and it's, you know, dragons and it's stuff like that. And that's all great. Same thing with paranormal vampires and witches and werewolves. And those are all great, too. But then I read sci-fi and I was like, oh, it can be literally anything. I mean, you can have a complete paranormal world on another planet and still call it sci-fi romance. And I think um, at least for the kind of sci-fi romance I write. One of the coolest things is that you're able, the reader is able to see these really, really cool, interesting worlds through the eyes of a modern human, somebody that they can connect with and somebody that they can see themselves in, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're, sometimes when you're reading paranormal, you're trying to see yourself in like a thousand year old vampire hunter and maybe that, you know? But when you're reading a lot of sci-fi romance, it's kind of, um, it's closer to home. And I think it's really interesting to to read a story through that lens. So mm-hmm. I would say focus on world building and what makes it different, your world, and what makes it the same. 
I love that perspective, the way that you've explained it as well, how readers can relate to that character, that modern uh, woman or man who's going into these new worlds. What then does your writing process look like, your nine till five, and do you have any interesting writing rituals? You need to light a candle or have music playing? Um, The only ritual or habit that I have for writing is that I don't have any single habit. (laughs) No, I mean, I have a few things that I do, but mostly I'm a complete 100% pantser. So the way I start a story is by, um, like I said, just daydreaming and thinking and thinking and thinking. And when something I think of makes me go, or squee, or you know what I mean, swoon, I lock onto that no matter how small it is. And then I go from there and I build everything else out from there. So it's kind of a, a backwards process for world building. So I tend to ask myself a lot of questions. So, you know, if this is true, what what else would be true, right? If they if there weren't a lot of men, how would the how would the government function? How would marriages function? What would they be doing? You know, so I do a lot of backward thinking in order to do my world building. Um, and I pants everything, everything. <laughs> it makes it a little bit tricky but I tried to plot a few times and it my god it was miserable I don't know how people do it (laughs) but the one thing I do do that I don't particularly like doing but I think that it's really important for me is I do pretty extensive uh character bios before I go in so I think of my characters I have these really really long questionnaires with questions that seem really unrelated to anything that's going to be happening in the story but the process of answering those questions as if um, as the character or even just thinking about what the answers to those questions might be lets me learn who they are so much that it when I'm writing, I know I can throw them in any situation. I can do anything. Anything can come up, but I know how they're going to react because I know who they are. So that's the one thing that I do do would be really, really long character bios with really um, specific questions. Speaking of character bios, then one thing that I loved on your social medias was the amount of um, character artwork and fan art you have. And I really want to talk about it because honestly, you have so much and I'm kind of a little bit jealous. (laughs) But why you think it's so important to have those um, images and those character fan arts? I think there's. I don't know. It's kind of two reasons, I guess. I, I, uh, number one, it makes me happy, right? I, I know from my own fandoms that I'm a part of that I'm voracious. I want to see every bit of character art. I want to buy every bit of merchandise. I want, I want anything that reminds me of that thing because it makes me happy. And so I knew providing those things for my readers would make them happy and it makes them want to share it and it hypes them up for the books and it hypes them up to remember the scene that the the art is from and I think that that is something that's really important to me and it makes me really happy but um on the business side of it I also think that having all of that really makes your brand feel more established it makes it feel more immersive so if a new reader you know, I think indie authors a lot of the time are still fighting that kind of idea that we're not as polished as traditional, traditionally published authors. We, we don't do things as well, right? Um, so if a reader goes onto my website and they see a really professional website, they see a merch store, they see newsletter, they go onto my Instagram, they see all of this character art and they see audiobooks and they see all of these things. I think it really makes for a very professional, immersive, large, like, brand that is something I can I think that makes it feel like they want to dive in because that so many people are talking about this and buying these things and doing this stuff why would I mean it obviously has to be good so it's a little bit of a fake it till you make it <laughs> yeah so. I'm curious when did you start noticing the snow snowball effect in your career so when you hit that publish button when did you start noticing that fan base really kicking up for yourself Um, I think there was a lot of luck involved for me at first, because like I said, I had been working on that book for a long time. Um, and it just happened that 
when I was finally re ready to publish it, it was, I think, March 2020. And that was right when lockdowns happened. And that was right when people were really diving into reading and really wanting an escape. And I had a nice cover. And I think they took a chance on my work without a ton of background. I mean, I didn't have a, I didn't really have a newsletter or a reader magnet or anything like that. Um, so I think I was really lucky in that regard that um, I, my book just came out at the right time. And then um, I was able, because at that time I had been teaching and we weren't going, we weren't working. Right. So I was able to stay home and people were starting to read my book and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And I have this free time. So I'll start on the second one and see how it goes. And so I wrote the second one and people were really excited about that too. And so by the time the year was up and my work was like hinting about coming back, um, I was, I stopped and I went full time then. So it was actually a pretty fast turnaround. And I was, I was really lucky and privileged though. You know, I had the ability to do that. I wasn't the sole breadwinner or anything in my household. So I was able to take that leap. And then um, I think I, everything really picked up after the Ruby Dixon TikTok craze, you know, because everybody was was already voracious for sci-fi romance at that point, and they were looking to books that are were already out, and they um, looked down mine. So it was a also a really lucky thing that happened. Yeah, but also it just goes to show how amazing that your books are as well. So it yeah. sounds like sounds like destiny and fate to me, if anything. <laughs> You know, I, I think my books are good. I think that they're enjoyable, but you know, there are a lot of really good books out there that never get the, the, the traction that they deserve. So I think it's a combination of that. I think I had a really good product that I worked really hard on and I invested a lot of money in and all of that. And then at the same time, there was an, an aspect of luck involved, I think, and good timing. Let's get into TikTok a little bit because I love your social media platforms and one that you do excel in is TikTok as well. And we mentioned Ruby Dixon uh, who went viral and it was crazy. And a lot of that's happening to a lot of authors on TikTok. It's a completely different world at the moment. So can you tell us what you have found has worked for you um, in regards to, we'll specify on TikTok in this case, um, and yeah, how you manage that account. So I I don't really like social media um, using it personally. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I love um, using it, but not posting about myself. So I love scrolling TikTok. I love seeing other people's posts, but I'm just not, I'm a very private person and I don't <laughs> enjoy posting things or coming up with content. Um, so I was having a really hard time with TikTok and with Instagram and Facebook, things like that. I really love a more personal interaction where I can talk to a reader one-on-one -on -one or message with them. And that's just not what most social media is, especially for authors trying to, you know, push their books. So at first, what I did with TikTok was I, I basically cold called or cold emailed yeah. um, TikTok creators. And I would say, you know, this is my book. These, this is what you might like about it. I saw from, you know, the other reviews that you've done that you like these sorts of things. This is what's in mine. And I kind of tried to sell it that way. And I got some traction there because if they did take a chance and they read my book and liked it, they would post about it, which was wonderful. But uh, after a while, I knew that, you know, I needed to start posting on there. It was, uh, I could see a direct correlation in sales every time somebody posted about my book. And so it was something that I knew needed to be done, but I knew I didn't want to do it. So I actually hired somebody, a social media manager who runs my, one of my TikTok accounts, my, um, the big one that actually makes the videos that are people like to watch. And she's amazing. She's wonderful. She's incredible. She, Angie, um, she, she was a reader first and she reached out looking for an art copy and she had, um, asked a little bit about my social media and why I wasn't on there because she was, um, really into social media and she offered her help. And so uh, I took her up on that really quickly. And I, we worked out a payment system and we've kind of, we spent a few months figuring all of that out. And now she does so much for me. She runs my Instagram and she runs that TikTok account and she, she creates the posts and 
she's just wonderful. She's just wonderful. Yeah. So I, um, I really believe in delegating out those tasks that drain me completely and make it so that I can't do the main thing that I need to do, which is write a, a good book. And um, this has really helped me with that. So any the, the girl that you see on the TikToks, that's Angie. Yeah. Give her a shout out. She's wonderful. <laughs> she honestly, she is. I all right, stalker alert, but I oh, was scrolling through for ages on your TikTok and I was like, these are clever. So yeah, she's doing really well done. Um, but I, I love this concept as well because delegation is such an important part in this business. And you know, not everyone can start off doing that until you get that um, finance in the budget. But when you get to a certain point, it makes sense to ask somebody else who really excels and loves doing those things instead of, as you said, it's very draining. We can't do all of the things, although we try to. And then if you don't like something, don't do it. (laughs) It's uh, it's as easy and crazy as that all at once. It's definitely a toss up. You really, you know, the control, I think most authors, especially indie authors like that control and you don't want to give your you know, your, your baby, your brand baby away to somebody else. But um, I think it's definitely worth it, you know. And of course, being very cautious, I want to say as well, just because I always say every um, sort of contract or every agreement you go into is much like a marriage. So you really need to make sure that you're being um, careful and you've done your research uh, because some of us have been burned in the past and that's not in a scary way or anything like that. But like any relationship, they don't always work out. So um, just make sure you're a hundred percent and get excited for the journey. What would you say that one of the most surprising things are that you found in this industry that you were not expecting when you went into it? The uh, community, the romance writing community. I mean, I don't know. I have never been a part of any kind of workforce or heard of anybody in any workforce where your coworkers are so open and generous and just wanting you to succeed and it's just it blew me away because I you know at first I came in with obviously still with the imposter syndrome and I would reach out and ask questions and I I was very nervous about how that would be received you know would I would they be closed off would they think that I'm trying to use them for information like I didn't know what to expect and everybody was so open I mean sharing their numbers sharing like what was possible, sharing what editor they use, where they got their covers, you know, all of these things that I didn't expect. And it was incredible. And it still is incredible. I think um, it's weird because now I have people who reach out to me and ask me advice on certain things. And I'm just so excited to give them all of the answers. And I think if I had been greeted at the beginning with gatekeeping and with secrecy, then I probably would be that way when people come to me today. And I think um, that kind of positivity and openness breeds that in the rest of the people who you work with. And at least in my subgenre and kind of the surrounding subgenres, um, that's what I've experienced. Everybody is just, just wonderful, really, really wonderful. And that was, that was so surprising. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think to, when you start receiving those messages asking for your advice and your input, it's almost shocking, but then you are so surprised by how much you've learned in that time because you learn so many different things that a lot of us wouldn't usually be exposed to, like social media, algorithms, you know, ads, how to do this, keywords, things like that. So it's surprising how much you learn in a short time, and that is thanks to having all that community and those resources were there any particular resources or groups that you found helped you on your journey and learning about this industry? Oh, I mean, too many to too many yeah. to mention. <laughs> um, I mean, I did so much research and it's hard to remember the the names. I mean, I'm a part of 101 Facebook groups. Um, sci-fi, I think when you're going into Facebook groups looking for support, going into groups of your subgenre is really important. So I'm in a part, I'm a part of a lot of um, sci-fi romance author groups or sci-fi romance marketing groups, stuff like that. I would post my covers and releases and stuff in there. And those were really helpful. Um, I also took a lot of writing classes 
like with live feedback online. I went to a bunch of romance conferences that were really helpful for, for the most part. Um, I just networking with people opens a lot of doors too. You know, I, by talking with others in my subgenre, I found out about a, you know, a messenger group that we're all a part of where everybody talks, which was really exciting. Um, I think something else though, that really helped me because I'm, I learned by doing is reading romance, not necessarily sci-fi romance, but just reading the genre of romance, but now with a critical eye has really helped me see a lot of things differently and see what works and what doesn't, and maybe why it didn't work, what I liked and why I liked it. And it's really helped me figure out kind of the things that you don't notice as a reader that make a good book. Um, it, it, it makes it so I don't enjoy reading as much as I did, unfortunately, but I think that um, reading really, really helps to understand what makes a good story. Completely agree with that. I find myself doing the same. Even yeah. with these now, it's a lot more critical. Yeah. But, oh, what a classic. What a cliche. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm very curious, would you consider or have you had any thoughts about writing a different kind of genre? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. I have um, I have actually a few different series in mind that I want to do. They're in um, adjacent genres it's just time you know I'm still learning and I'm still chugging away and I'm not a I'm not a fast writer and I am a classic procrastinator and so uh I just I think I need to learn keep learning how to be quicker so that I can work on other projects while still getting out the stories that I really want to tell on my sci-fi romance series so I do. I, I would like to write a fantasy romance, two fantasy romances, and then like a cheeky little paranormal standalone. <laughs> and that's the interesting thing is our process always changes over the years. You know, what you were doing at the start's probably changed your, not necessarily your writing style, but like your nine till five, what that looks like for you. You know, you know what you're capable of. You can probably write more words now in one sitting. Um so it's really interesting. There's there's nothing ever that's really set in stone, I find, in this, which is really exciting. What would you say then your greatest challenge and your greatest accomplishment has been so far? Oh, I mean, just that, learning what my process is and being kind to myself while I learn what my process is. I think it's really, really difficult to see what other people are doing and it, it's hard not to compare yourself and your own um achievements to other people you know how are they managing two pen names and three social media platforms and releasing a book a month i don't understand how it's possible or how does this person not use a developmental editor and they're, they they're able to just use a line editor and their books are great i don't get it so there's there was a lot of that and just a lot of learning um, about which things help me and which things don't. Um, not reading reviews has been a big one. Can't do that. Um, only having a limited number of beta readers because too many opinions just makes me stand still. Trusting my own instincts about what works and what doesn't, you know, all of those things. Um, and I think also for me and for the way that I work, I, I have a, I realized apparently the same, you know, it's funny, the same um, college teacher who wanted me to get tutoring also said that I should probably go get screened for ADHD. And I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> and I didn't take it seriously at all. Turns out I have ADHD. <laughs> and um, so I'm now learning how that affects my writing and how I need to manage myself and my mental health in order to to do the thing that I love and still love it, but also run a successful business. And one of the biggest things that I've had to come to terms with is that nine to five, five days a week doesn't work. I can't do it. You know, I'll, I need to have, I need to leverage my ADHD and, and know that when I'm hyper-focused and excited about something that I'm going to be working and it's just going to take over my life. And then there might be two weeks that goes by that I don't do anything at all. And I just fill my well and build up that inspiration and watch movies and intake stories so that I get excited again. 
and that that's okay that the you know that westernized idea of productivity and the nine to five is just a construct and it's not something that works for everybody and that's all right you know it's not unprofessional to create in that way so that's been really difficult but that is something that I'm still learning to do one thing I do want to brush up on here and I hear it quite often on here is beating ourselves up so we're very very critical on ourselves and if we're not being productive in that moment and there's a lot of imbalance for so many of us when it comes to work and home life and just giving ourselves that time to just restore and I think it's a struggle and a journey for every single author to find that balance and I mean I still haven't cracked it personally (laughs) I just title myself as a workaholic but it's unhealthy so what have you found anything else aside from obviously knowing when you're hyper focused that's the time to be productive and then being kind to yourself when you're getting that inspiration elsewhere have you had any conversations or do you remind yourself of things daily that it's okay to not be working 24 seven? I do. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things that has helped me is to tell myself and to explain to people around me who see me not working and wonder what that is, you know, that I'm lazy or whatever, that existing in the world as a creative is work. It is working. I'm constantly taking in stimuli from all around me. I'm constantly getting ideas. And I'm constantly storing those for later use. And if I'm forcing myself to be at a computer all the time, that doesn't necessarily happen. I'm I'm forcing something else that is not, you know, filling that creative well. So sometimes just sitting around or sitting outside or taking a day and, you know, doing nothing, getting drunk on a Tuesday because I work from home and I can't, you know, just enjoying my life. That is kind of work because I am doing something that in the process of creating helps me create. So I think thinking of it that way and not thinking of it in not saying I'm taking time away from work, but just saying this is a lifestyle and this is part of my, the way that I express myself and it is work. All of it is work because, you know, that's how I'm able to produce things that people love. Yeah. So thinking about it that way has really helped me. And I think it's really helped um, my husband and other people understand how how I do things, I think. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. And I think it is. It's very, not that we have to justify ourselves to anyone, but it is a completely different career choice. So I think a lot of people outside of this industry struggle with the concept that it's not just sitting at a laptop and writing so I love that you have that conversation with yourself and you encourage that that's okay as well I think a lot of us could benefit from that as well yeah I mean it's really difficult you know you you people are like well you're home all day why can't you you know what I mean and I'm like well I am home all day and sometimes I can do those things and sometimes I can't do those things and it's not it's not a, you know, I heard a lot of people, I think at a few cons- conferences saying that this is how they explain it to their family. They say, my office hours are from nine to five. And if that's the way that you're able to work, that's incredible. But I think it's okay to not work that way and to not show your family that that's the only way to be uh, successful. What would your top three marketing tips be? Marketing tips? Um I think, like I said, um, building brand, your brand and building the excitement around your brand in adding things to it, you know, special edition covers and character art and audiobooks and translations and all of these things that just make it bigger and bigger and bigger, but all are based off of this one accomplishment that you've made in that one book, right? I think those are all things that really help to... I don't know, just make make your brand seem more recognizable and more exciting and all of that. Um, we also do a lot of uh, Amazon ad advertising and uh, Facebook advertising. TikTok is hugely, hugely effective for getting a return on investment. Um, other than that, for marketing, I don't really do a whole a whole lot. You know, I I try and let the my books stand for themselves and 
Uh, I try not to get bogged down in that kind of stuff because it, it, I, I will stress about it and then it, it won't, it won't produce anything beneficial for me if I do. And takes away time from your books as well, writing the next book that the readers want and love. And then let's talk a little bit about readers because readers obviously made the dream come alive. What has been one of the most memorable reader interaction moments for you? Man, so many, so many moments. Um, one of the ones that I, that stands out to me is uh, I, I've done one book signing only, only one book signing, but at that book signing, I, there were a few readers who I knew were coming, who I talked to on Facebook and um, they showed up and, you know, I was at my table, you know, trying to sell my books and be a salesperson, which is just awful. It's torturous. And um, I see, you know, somebody walking up to me and they're wearing a shirt and it has all of my characters' names on it. And I looked at them and I was like, what? <laughs> Those are, that's on this table. That's what's over here. And it was surreal. It was so incredible. And then there were two others that were wearing shirts too. And they were all um, made by another one of my readers, Ren Designs, who is just wonderful, just the sweetest human. And um, that was pretty special to see that. Yeah. So that was, a, that was, a nice I love one. that. You see your world coming alive. I love that yeah. so much. This is one of my favorite questions to ask. What is the goal? What is the big dream for you in your author career? The bigger, the better. Yeah, I, this is going to be a boring, boring answer. I don't really have any lofty goals. You know, I, um, I think with my life and some of the things that have happened, I really try and focus on just being happy every day and, you know, achieving attainable things and bringing joy to other people. And I feel like I've already achieved so much. I'll, I mean, I don't, I don't need a movie and I don't need all of these kinds of things. I just, I want my readers to be happy and I want to bring joy to them. And I want them to, you know, be, be voracious in wanting to learn more about the world and, and reading my books. And I think, um, I'm already kind of doing that day to day. So I feel like I'm already living the dream. I'm just, mm -hmm wanting to be happy and be grateful for everything that I already have and already am achieving. Perfect. So, sorry, that's not, not a very exciting yeah. answer. I, I love that answer, though. I, I really do. And I'm glad that you're already living that as well. So congratulations. You deserve it. Um, I do have a segment. So it's called Speed Dating with an Author. I've lit a candle. I've created ambience. But basically what it is is five rapid questions. Are you ready? Definitely taking a sip of the gin. <laughs> that gin in there. All right. All right. What is the clumsiest moment you've ever had? I've ever had? I, I'm not a particularly clumsy, physically clumsy person, just because I think I don't ever leave the house or do anything that would put me in a clumsy situation like sports. But um, mentally clumsy, I think... Uh, a few weeks ago, my mom was flying in from the airport on a red eye uh, overnight, and she wanted me to pick her up. I don't know why, but she, she wanted me to pick her up. And so I went, um, I got up early. I went to pick her up. I was waiting at the airport. And she's like, honey, I'm coming tomorrow, tomorrow morning. And I was like, what are you talking about? You said you're leaving on this date. And I was like, yeah, that's today, but it's a red eye. So it arrives tomorrow. <laughs> So I had to go back home and then I had to drive all the way there again the next morning. So that was pretty clumsy mentally. What are the three words that best describe you? Um, I'm creative and I think um, loyal and probably a homebody. Somebody. Procrastinator. Something like that. <laughs> I feel like all of us also slip that one in. Procrastinator. <laughs> We're good at that. <laughs> what is your life motto? Um, treat yourself. <laughs> treat yourself. No. Um, sorry, that's it. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, either that or just you know follow happiness. Mm -hmm. you know choose happiness when it's hard to do something yeah. like that along those lines what is the song that best describes you does anybody have a good answer for this ever 
Do you know everyone struggles with it? I love it because honestly, if somebody asked me this question, I wouldn't have an answer. So that's why I like putting everyone on the spot. <laughs> For sure. All right. All right. Let's read your books and see, <laughs> see what those steamy <laughs> scenes are like. Okay. Sorry. Um, I think um, uh, Golden Years by David Bowen. It's a good one. Just enjoying your years while they're fun and happy. I love David Bowie. I was looking, he's on my little wall there. He's a little embroidery. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. I will accept that answer. That is a good answer. What is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about? I have a degree in archaeology. So I was an archaeologist for a little bit. Um, I flew planes when I was younger, the Cessna when I was younger. I'm a, I like to cook a lot. I was in culinary school for a little bit before I decided it wasn't for me. So two things. Wow. I can whistle and hum at the same time. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> I like to I... hang out in my house and I don't know. Oh, yeah, you just pulled out some big ones there. My goodness. I have had so much fun today, though. What uh, What do we need to know? What's coming out? And most importantly, where do we find you? Where do we connect? Um, well, I'm working right now in my sixth book of the Clicanian series. So that should be out end of October, beginning of November. Like I said, I'm a procrastinator. So one of the steps of my process is not knowing exact release dates until I have a draft done because otherwise it's just too, I, I don't know. So it's going to be uh, late October, early November. And then the next book should be out in that series should be out sometime in the spring of next year. Um, in October, uh, we were talking a little bit about the character art on all the commissions. They're wonderful and I love them, but they are expensive. And so I am looking to offset that cost a little bit. We're going to be opening a Patreon in October where we'll have a lot of the art commission and then we'll be hopefully be able to commission more and offset the cost of it a little bit. There'll be some exclusive NSFW on there. And also um, patrons will be able to receive ARCs, which it will be fun, I hope. <laughs> um, other than that, you can find me on my website at victoriaaveline.com. Um, my Instagram is at Victoria Aveline Author. My TikTok, my personal one that has very few videos, mostly of my dogs, is um, at Victoria Aveline. And then the TikTok that Angie runs, which is which is a lot more fun and actually has information about my books and stuff, is the Epic Lacanian series. So it's the series name. On Facebook, I'm at Victoria Aveline Books. And if you want to join my reader group, that's pretty fun too. My PA Gwen is awesome. She posts in there a lot. She has a lot of like discussions and um, giveaways and stuff. And that's uh, Victoria Aveline Reader Group in, in Facebook. So in all of those places, you can find me. Yes, I'm so excited and uh, definitely following all those. I have not yet gone into the group, but I will be after that. I'm going to fix that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I've had such a blast today. Oh, me too. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And who knows, watch your space. Maybe we'll get you on next year and see how you're going. Yeah, I'd be happy to be back. Well, I'm going to love you and leave you, but um, have a good day. Right. Bye. Bye, guys.